<laughs> All right. Let me know Already when you can see sign. that. Can you see I it? Can, I can see it. Okay. I'm going to go into presentation mode, just make sure I'm not seeing the preview. Are you seeing the preview yes. or the presentation? Yes, I'm seeing the nicely. presentation. Yep. All good. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, everyone, <laughs> uh, for your patience with this. This is one of the perils of uh, presenting virtually, and Ruth and I are in two different places. Um, but we are um, really excited to be able to share some of some of the uh, explorations we've been doing in this area of seeking to co-create inclusive vocabularies and to identify ways of standardizing practices in relation to data use. Uh, before we begin, uh, on behalf of Ruth and myself, we just wanted to add our acknowledgements uh, and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all meeting and uh, working. Uh, in my case, I'm sitting on Gaia Mago land. And I'm on Camaragal land. Uh, and so we would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations participants in this symposium or any First Nations people listening to the recordings uh, at a later date. Uh, just because thematically what we're really looking at are the issues of the, the value and the necessity of social engagement. I love this particular representation of dream, dream song lines and tracks in Australia, which, which builds a map of Australia not topographically, but through the connections of, of one person, one community to another over time. So, so that that is, if you like, one of the themes uh, that hopefully we'll be uh, trying to show in practical uh, ways in what we're talking about today. So what we're talking about is the necessity of um, working towards a common language uh, and I think this cartoon kind of says it all so often, you know, this, you know, the challenge of being explicit. And I think Rob did a really uh, lovely job of, of pointing out what, what I often call making the invisible visible, this, this challenge that we have in terms of getting people to appreciate that to get from A to B, there's, there's, there's a real, uh, there's an awful lot of work uh, that sometimes needs to be made more visible. Uh, this is particularly true, you know, as the examples have been shown in today's um, presentations and in yesterday's. Uh, this applies especially to communities that are seeking to link data sets uh, at the global level. So Ruth and I are both working in ISO uh, standards uh, challenges, dealing with data use, ethics, and um, the idea of standardizing tr trustworthiness. Uh, as part of JTC1, which is a uh, technical uh, and communications uh, aspect of ISO. Uh, I'm also a part of the World Fair projects, the Solar Ball uh, Global Health Urban Health um, case study in particular. I've been associated with CoData for a few years now, dealing with data ethics and resilient cities. Um, so, oh. have I just, oh no, so um, can you still see me? My yep. connection seems okay. My connection just suddenly dropped. That's that's the power of the machine. When you're talking ethics, it doesn't like it. But what but what we see this as is a social issue in terms of the data interoperability, uh, and it is particularly as as I wanted to show um, in this example on the next slide. Uh, it is it is a socio technical challenge. It's one where um, Bruce, if you're able to advance, oh there, okay. Um, Categorizations and classifications have political power, they have ideological power, as well as cognitive power. Uh, and this example, uh, I think, shows just the challenge in terms of, of where, what words you use, how you use them, and where they are placed in any sort of vocabulary. So this, this paper references the debate around um, the naming of chronic fatigue syndrome and classifying it as either a medical or a psychological or a mental health um, concern. That has profound consequences, not just for the person being named and labeled in that way, it has profound consequences for how information might be found, how, how uh, a person looking for treatment would be dealt with, uh, or how researchers seeking to address the challenges in this space would find information or start to make sense of it. So, so the language that we are choosing uh, is, is critical for giving voice to data. 
uh, it transforms that then into information and insight. So, so the ways that that words are used uh, certainly is is a very powerful device. It can enable, but it can also constrain. So, um, what we're seeking to to do is really slow things down a little bit and enrich the process. Uh, I've I've always liked this statement from David Levy, who's an information ethicist who, who worked for a long time as part of the Xerox PARC uh, group of uh, anthropologists and technologists seeking to understand human computer interaction. Uh, and that very much has shaped the work I do as a social informaticist, looking at the connection between people, information and emerging technologies. Uh, and his concern is that we have lost a, the time to look and to think at precisely the moment we started to develop these very advanced tools for investigation and communication. I certainly saw that um, uh, you know, as a bit of a, a backstory to me. So I trained as a librarian back in the 90s, uh, became a teacher of librarians, particularly around classification and indexing, and then undertook a PhD in information science, information retrieval, where I was looking to understand the ways that researchers were using representations of ideas in these um, newly networked information systems. So it was an ethnographic exploration to try to get a better understanding of the sense-making process that was related to finding what you are looking for. And the, the researchers that I was witnessing um, undertaking this work over a two-year process were breaking new ground, which is often the case when you're undertaking research. You're looking for um, information that you don't necessarily have a name for yet, but you're seeking to enrich your understanding and look for information to support your thinking. And what I found and what it confirms what a lot of people anecdotally would, would recognize is you often don't, you often at first know what you don't want before you know what you want. Um, sometimes you can very quickly, when you're engaging with a representation of content online, you can make that decision instantaneous. Um, but many times it comes through the slow unfolding and the interaction and engagement with those ideas as they are represented in an abstract or in a title. Um, sometimes you have to read the whole paper. So that takes time. It takes time to think about that. It takes time to link. The same thing is true in terms of trying to find a way to speak the same language. What I was witnessing was the person trying to find the way to speak the same language as the communities and ideas represented in those texts. And what we're talking about here in the work that Ruth and I've been doing is similar, trying to appreciate the context, trying to understand the communities um, who, who are represented or seeking to understand what is represented, meeting them on their own ground, and often because we are looking at issues around ethics and building trust and governance, you're talking about values and social practices that are very difficult to define in any distinct discrete way consistently across communities. So you're trying to map the context in the environment and really work towards co-constructing some sort of common understanding uh, that also accommodates the fact that there will be multiple interpretations. So in this work, we're also looking, um, we've been inspired by not just the FAIR principles, but the ideas of care that come from the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, uh, looking at different ways of, of baking in um, involvement with the community from the very beginning and continuously in the decisions that you're doing, um, ensuring that you have inclusive practices and giving the time to that, privileging that process, that, that aspect in the middle, that magic middle in some ways. It is translational work. And that translational work takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of diplomacy. Um, there's a, there, there is a need for mechanisms for feedback in all directions, and also a need to listen and learn and adapt. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to Ruth. Okay, so I'm going to give a, a couple of examples of um, what we've been doing recently and, and how we've been trying to address that and, and why we also think that this is um, so important. So it, in the context of some of the more sort of um, the technical discussions we've been hearing uh, yesterday and today, it's really looking at the, at the F in FAIR um, in, a, in a broader sense uh, and the C in the care, looking at the collective benefit and collective perspective on, on the data. 
So in, in, in terms of making it, um, making the um, information findable, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be findable when you're talking about standards within the entire community that's consuming that standard. And sometimes that can be extremely broad. Uh, and when you're talking about setting out internal frameworks for the management and use of data, and a lot of um, what Rob was saying uh, in the previous presentation completely uh, resonates with me um, in my day job doing um, data analytics um, in the learning space and, and having to reinvent the way that we tag uh, our, our, our artifacts, our data artifacts every time so that we've got some understanding of, of how that should be interpreted in our analytics. So um, that's definitely part of it too. So um, when we're encouraging um, communities to standardize on terminologies, we need to also look back about how that, how does that link back into the wider community and be aware of that translational piece that is at some point going to be part of the work that you do. If um, you're, you're, um, if you're working together very closely um, as experts in your specific research fields, there will be a point in which um, that uh, need, it needs to be communicated and implemented back in the real world. And we need to make sure that we're using language that is accessible to the uh, affected people and, and uh, also uh, meets them on their own ground so that they have a, a real sense of, um, of um, participation in that. Otherwise, um, we do get uh, adoption and, and, and trust issues. Uh, so that's really where we are. We're um, bridging that gap into the community. Um, and oh, let me go back a minute, just sorry, and explain how. So, so the first step um, of that is, is getting, as I said, um, understanding the context of uh, where this um, information sits and who in the real world, or if, um, dare I say, will be um, will be interacting with it or participating in, in the use of that language or that vocabulary at some point. So we sort of did quite a lot of analysis when we were putting standards together um, or, or a, a data use framework um, to uh, for a government organization in trying to understand where that um, where the recipients of that or the subjects of that data sit. And that's a sort of very simplified version or sort of cut down version of the sort of diagram where you're looking at organizations, the people linking those organizations, um, the policies and documents and actual artifacts that are being generated by those and how people interact with those, how that affects their day-to-day -day lives and then the language that's actually used within those. And, and with that discovery process, we're then able to start think, identifying who in the community um, needs to be part of the process of defining the vocabulary for that for the uh, for our organization, the government organization, um, and and how well the terminology and vocabulary that we're using in us in our um, framework um, will resonate with them. And do we now need to have a separate set of vocabularies or terms that we can use in discussions with other groups in the in the broader community? Um, and so that's a co-creation piece. And, and the first piece of that is actually understanding who's out there, what's the landscape, and, and who should be involved in that in that discussion. So that's um, the first sort of piece of work that needs to be done. Um, and then following on from that, we can then start looking at, it, at, at the terms within our organization, right? So then there was a fairly significant piece of work that Teresa and I did um, within the understanding of who the community is that's being affected and what, um, what um, the vocabulary sort of, uh, what resonates within those different um, communities and what doesn't. Um, we then start to look internally with that context and understand how vocabulary is being used within the organization or across the different different parts of that organization. So what you see here is, and again, for reasons of um, confidentiality, we can't give you a sort of detailed view, but what you see here is a sort of breakdown of documents, which are the little green dots, um, terms that are specified within those documents, and then organizational departments or agencies that use those. 
and what the interactions are. It's actually turned out to be a much bigger and messier map than that. So I just thought I'd have this simplified version for you to sort of see. And then you can see by the colors of the lines, whether they're producing or consuming those documents, whether it's actually going to affect how they operate or whether they're defining the standards and terms by which other people operate. And therefore they're the ones that own and define the vocabulary as well. And then we can start to see how well shared those certain pieces of vocabulary are across the organization. 15 um, minutes, how, really? 15 okay, minutes. I will quickly go to the last slide. I didn't realize we we're coming out of time. From a context of ISO, a similar sort of operation uh, took place, but it was really about trying to not um, standardize on people's on vocabulary, but understand that, um, and here's a very simple example with, with a, a simple term data set, that depending on where you're coming from, i.e. are you um, defining it in terms of genomics and geographic information, or something that's addressing a much more uh, broader church in terms of broad information technology, you're going to be finding the same word in, in slightly different ways. We need to be able to keep to that because we're communicating that word out to our subject matter experts who are ultimately the data subjects and, and the broader community at the end of the day, and we have to meet them on their ground. So we have to find a way of finding a, a way of linking these together and understanding their origins and their context. Um, and not over standardizing on one term and being too obsessed with getting that single term right, because it never will be effectively. And over time, it will change as well. So um, on that note, um, we so what we're doing is trying to develop um, frameworks and skills development programs really to help people work through that co-creation piece and understand what's important and what's not in approaching a sort of broader, more inclusive um, vocabulary discovery approach. Thank you.